Hello, hello. Um, let's see. They don't make this very easy to share, do they? Nope, nope, nope. I guess we'll have to share it afterwards. Uh, oh, share. Hey guys, good morning. Uh, thanks for joining me. Um, as you know, I've been doing all these readings. Elon has been too. Good morning, good morning to everybody, or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, finished a whole amazing book on uh, intuition. Have moved on to a book that directly deals with courage. Um, it's called uh, Courage, the Joy of Living Dangerously. Uh, it's been enlightening to say the least so far. What's going on, Danny? <laughs> Tiger, I'll take it. Uh, so today I'm going to do a quick reading for you guys on the way of intelligence. And then if you have any comments, questions, uh, at the end of it I'll do a little dissertation. And then i got a hard stop right before 11 o'clock my time. So here we go. Intelligence is aliveness. It is spontaneity. It is openness, it is vulnerability, it is impartial, uh, impartiality, it is the courage to function without conclusions. And why do I say it's courage? It is courage because when you function out of a conclusion, the conclusion protects you. The conclusion gives you security, safety. You know it well, you know how to connect to it, you are very efficient with it. To function without a conclusion is to function in innocence. There is no security, you may go wrong, you may go astray. One who is ready to go on the exploration called truth has to be ready also to commit many errors, mistakes, has to be able to risk. One may go astray, but that is how one arrives. Going many, many times astray, one learns how to not go astray. Committing many mistakes, one learns what is a mistake and how not to commit it. Knowing what is error, one comes closer and closer to what is truth. It is an individual exploration you cannot depend on other conclusions. You were born as a no. Uh, you were born as a no mind. Let this sink into your heart as deeply as possible, because through that a door opens. If you were born as a no mind, then the then the mind is just a social product. It is nothing natural. It is cultivated. It has been put together on top of you. Deep down, you are still free. You can get out of it. One can never get out of nature, but one can get out of the artificial any moment one decides to. Existence precedes thinking. So existence is not a state of mind. It is a state beyond. To be, not to think, is the way to know the fundamental. Science means thinking. Philosophy means thinking. Theology means thinking. Religiousness does not mean thinking. The religious approach is a non-thinking approach. It is a more intimate. It brings you closer to reality. It drops all that hinders. It unblocks you. You start flowing into life. You don't think that you are separate, looking. You don't think that you are a watcher, aloof and distant. You meet, mingle, and merge into reality. And there is a different kind of knowing. It cannot be called knowledge. It is more like love, less like knowledge. It is so intimate that the word knowledge is not sufficient to express it. The word love is more adequate, more expressive. In the history of human consciousness, the first thing that evolved was magic. Magic was a combination of science and religion. Magic, magic had something of the mind and something of the no mind. Then, out of magic grew philosophy. Then, out of philosophy grew science. Magic was both no mind and mind. Philosophy, philosophy was only mind. And then mind plus experimentation became science. Religiousness is a state of no mind. Religiousness and science are the two approaches to reality. Science approaches through the secondary. Religiousness goes direct. Science is an indirect approach. Religiousness is an immediate approach. Science goes round and round. Religiousness simply penetrates to the heart of reality. A few more things. Thinking can think only about the known. It can chew the already chewed. Thinking can never be original. How can you think about the unknown? Whatsoever you can manage to think will belong to the known. You can think only because you know. At the most, thinking can create new combinations. At, at most, thinking can create new combinations. You can think about a horse who flies in the sky, who is made of gold, but nothing is new. You know birds who fly in the sky, you know gold, you know horses, you combine the three together. At the most, thinking can imagine new combinations, but it cannot know the no unknown. The unknown remains beyond it. So thinking goes in circles, goes on knowing, goes on knowing the known again and again and again. It goes on chewing the chewed. Thinking is never original. To come upon reality originally, radically, to come upon reality without any mediator, to come upon reality as if you were the first person to exist, that is liberating. 
the very newness of it liberates. Truth is an experience, not a belief. Truth never comes by studying about it. Truth has to be encountered. Truth has to be faced. The person who studies about love is like the person who studies about the Himalayas by looking at the map and the mountains. The map is not the mountain. And if you start believing in the map, you will go on missing the mountain. If you become too much obsessed with the map, the mountain may be there, just in front of you, but still, you will not be able to see it. And that's how it is. The mountain is in front of you, but your eyes are so full of maps. Maps of the mountain, maps about the same mountain, made by different explorers. Somebody has climbed the mountain from the north side, somebody from the east. They have made different maps. Quran, Bible, Gita, different maps of the same truth, but you are too full of the maps, too burdened by their weight. You cannot move even an inch. You cannot see the mountain just standing in front of you. It's virgin snow peaks shining like gold in the morning sky, in the morning sun. You don't have the eyes to see it. The prejudiced eye is blind. The heart full of conclusions is dead. Too many of prior assumptions and your intelligence starts losing its sharpness, its beauty, its intensity. It becomes dull. Dull intelligence is what is called intellect. Your so-called intel intelligentsia are not really intelligent. They are just intellectual. Intellect is a corpse. You cannot decorate it. You cannot decorate it with great pearls, diamonds, emeralds, but still a corpse is a corpse. To be alive is totally different matter. Science means being definite, being absolutely definite about facts. And if you are very definite about facts, then you cannot feel the mysterious. The more definite you are, the more mysterious evaporates. Mystery needs a certain vagueness. Mystery needs something undefined, undem uh, undemocratic. Science is factual. Mystery is not factual. It is existential. A fact is only a part of existence, a very small part. And science deals with parts because it's easier to deal with parts. They are smaller. You can analyze them. You are not overwhelmed by them. You cannot process them in your hands. Uh, you cannot possess them in your hands. You can dissect them. You can label them. You can be absolutely certain about their qualities, quantities, possibilities. But in that very process, mystery is being killed. It is being killed. Science is a murder of mystery. If you want to experience the mysterious, you will have to enter through another door from a totally different dimension. The dimension of the mind is the dimension of science, and the dimension of meditation is the dimension of the miraculous, the mysterious. Meditation makes everything undefined. Meditation takes you into the unknown, the uncharted. Meditation takes you slowly, slowly into a kind of disillusion where the observer and the observed become one. Now that is not possible in science. The observer has to be the observer, and the observed has to be the observed. And a clear-cut distinction has to be maintained continuously. Not even for a single moment should you, should you forget yourself. Not even for a single moment should you become interested, dissolved, overwhelmed, passionate, loving toward the object of your inquiry. You have to be detached. You have to be very cold. Cold, absolutely indifferent. And indifference kills mystery. If you really want the experience of the mysterious, then you have to open a new door in your being. I'm not saying stop being a scientist. I'm simply saying that science can remain peripheral activity to you. When in the lab, be a scientist. But when you come out of the lab, forget all about science. Then listen to the birds and not in a scientific way. Look at the flowers and not in a scientific way. Because when you look at a rose in a scientific way, it is a totally different kind of thing that you are looking at. It is not the same rose that a poet experiences. The experience does not depend on the object. The experience depends on the experiencer, on the quality of the experiencing. Looking at a flower, become the flower. Dance around the flower. Sing a song. The wind is cool and crisp. The sun is warm and the flower is in its prime. The flower is dancing in the wind, rejoicing, singing a song, singing hallelujah. Participate with it. Drop indifference. Objectivity, detachment. Drop all your scientific attitudes. Become a little more fluid, more melting, more merging. Let the flower speak to you, your heart. Let the flower enter your being. Invite him. He is a guest. And then you will have some taste of mystery. This is the first step towards the mysterious. And if you can be a participant for a moment, you have known the key, the secret of the ultimate step. Then become a participant in everything you are doing. Walking. Don't just do it uh, mechanically. Don't just go on watching it. Be it. Dancing. Don't do it technically. Technique is irrelevant. You, uh, you may be technically correct and you will miss the whole joy of it. Dissolve yourself in the dance. Become the dance. Forget about the dancer. When such deep unity starts happening in many, many phases of your life, when all around you start having such tremendous experiences of disappearance, egolessness, nothingness, when the flower is there and you are not, 
the rainbow is there and you are not, when the clouds are roaming in the sky, both within and without, and you are not. When there is utter silence, as far as you are concerned, then there is nobody in you, just a pure silence, a virgin silence, undistracted, undisturbed by logic, thought, emotion, feeling. That is the moment of meditation. Mind is gone, and when mind is gone, mystery enters. Awesome sauce, as my friend Landon, who's on here, says. So, uh, yeah, guys, any thoughts on that? Any takeaways from this excerpt? Um, you know, in all the things I read with Osho, I think his uh, contemplative way of delivering, um, I think, like, simple to see visuals about how living inside of yourself and not in the mind is uh, a really beautiful thing. He does a very poetic job of it. So uh, if you do have comments and questions, um, you want to hear my musings by all means, please uh, comment in the box below and I'll be happy to uh, relay my thoughts back to you. Of course, I'm always open to all yours as well. Uh, with that said, guys, I'm going to log off, go take my call. Love you so much. Have a wonderful day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody.